Well, so all we need to do is pick out a distortion function now. So let's go to our senior management and say, let's draw a curve. Uh, can imagine, imagine just trying to get one person to, to articulate his risk preference in one of these curves. Uh, less uh, a room full of them and getting them to agree on, on a curve. So there's a bit of a problem here. And, and, and really, what's the problem here is that there are too many choices. Uh, infinitely many. And, and in fact, it's worse than infinitely many. It's infinite dimensional. Uh, picking one number between zero and one, that's, there's infinite possibilities there. But a whole curve, that's an infinite number of points you have to choose. So even though there are a number of constraints on it, it's still way too many degrees of freedom here. So what we're going to do is uh, talk about ways of limiting that. And that's when we get into uh, parametric spectral measures. And I'm going to go through a couple of them today just to give you a flavor of what parametric spectral measures are about. And tomorrow we'll be visiting them in much more detail. So, so this part is just kind of like an intro to parametric spectral measures. Two famous ones, proportional hazards. The G function has a very specific form it is s raised to some power between 0 and 1. And uh, a half is very popular, the square root function. So imagine what's that going to look like. Oh, it's, uh, it's the right shape. Yeah, OK. It has that uh, exponent, that tau, has to be between 0 and 1. If it isn't, it's not going to be concave. So Now the other famous one is the Wang transform. And this is a little more complicated here. We're, we're building from the inside out. So you know, the input to the function is s, our exceedance probability. Uh, and what first thing we're going to do is we're going to take the inverse normal CDF function of that. So, for example, if the exceedance probability was 5%, then phi inverse of that is going to be negative 1.645. Remember all these magic numbers. So we're putting it on the normal z scale. We're taking the probability, translating it to the normal z scale. Then we're going to translate it. We're going to add a load alpha to it, add a translation to it. And then we're going to go back into the probability level. So if we started at negative 1.645, added something to it, we're going to the right, we go back to cumulative probability, we're going to have a larger number than S. So again, we're going to have uh, a curve going up. Uh, and in fact, I can show you what they look like. Uh, these have been calibrated. There's three sets here. Uh, the, uh, these have all been designed to shift the mean of a standard unit normal distribution. Uh, the lower ones uh, by a half, alpha is a half. It turns out that the Wang transform is very handy to talk about doing this to uh, normal distributions because that's what a Wang transform does. It just shifts a normal distribution, everything. So it's going to shift the mean too. So the lower ones, alpha equals 0.5, it's going to shift by a half. The middle one, shift by one. The upper one, shift by two. So that's the, the black dotted lines are the actual G functions that you get from the Wang transform. Now the red ones uh, have been calibrated to do the same mean shift on the proportional hazards. And you can see they're not doing the same thing. I mean, you're getting the same result. You're getting the same mean shift. But you, it, you're doing different things to different portions. If you look way off to the left, the small exceedance probabilities representing the large losses the red lines are above the dotted black lines. So the proportional hazard is being more aggressive at pushing up those low probabilities. And then they, then they cross, and at the other end, they're not working as hard on the high exceedance probabilities. And uh, although I know Steve is, uh, is allergic to PDFs, uh, I still want to show you because I think it's the best way to understand what's really going on here. If we started with our original normal distribution in, in brown there, it has a zero mean, then what a Wang transform with an alpha of two would do to it, if you just took point by point and took every exceedance S, figured out what its distorted exceedance was, and then, so now I have a, a new cumulative, and then I took the derivatives to draw the PDF, it would just shift that normal distribution over by two units. So the, the dotted black line, is just the, everything shifted over by two units. But the proportional hazards transform, giving you the same mean shift, is not giving you at all the same distribution. It's, uh, it's, it's a little skewed, uh, and it's got much 
Uh, it's got a higher standard deviation to it. So the, the upshot is we have two families of distortion functions and, and consequently two families of spectral risk measures. And you can pluck one from each family to calibrate to do one thing that you want. You know, we can set it to do uh, something specific to the mean. We can set it to do something to a particular percentile. We can get them to line up, but they're not going to do the same thing across the board. So what family you're choosing from, if you want to go look for a parametric spectral measure, you need to understand what these different guys are doing. And that is going to be uh, the, a big part of what tomorrow is about, is looking at uh, parametric spectral measures from a couple perspectives to figure out what, uh, what we should need to look at to de determine what we're going to use in practice. And we can see some generalizations here. For the, for the Wang transform, uh, on the outer function, we had a normal CDF. We could use a T distribution instead, and that's appeared in the literature. It's a Wang, sometimes called a Wang T. Uh, unfortunately, that has some undesirable properties. So if you change both the inner inverse normal and the outer normal to be T distributions, you can have what we were calling a TT distribution. Uh, and we'll we'll look at those tomorrow. We'll see, we'll see pictorially what's going on there. The proportional hazards. Uh, can be seen as a special case of a log linear distortion function uh, that uh, may have to be capped, uh, but that's okay. Uh, that's, that's kosher, that's accepted. So that's log linear is a generalization of the proportional hazards. And then TVAR, we can see, can be generalized to linear or piecewise linear functions like the one Jesse used. Uh, in spreadsheets. So tomorrow we're going to look at a whole bunch of these and we're going to try and sort through their properties and, and come to some conclusions about when we might want to use one versus another one. John and Jesse are going to go through lots of examples and they have, you know, there's a few sort of differences, right? So this is our, this is a proportional hazard, which I'm sure you've probably all heard of. It's just a, like a square root function. Um, they, they can then have this property where they can go up to one and then kind of flatline, all right? So that has, a, has an impact in terms of uh, distorted. <laughs> this down here is my G prime. So this is the thing I'm using to adjust the individual event probabilities. The interesting thing with the flatlining is it's saying I'm going to give zero weight to certain scenarios down here. Um, then we can have uh, the one other interesting property we can have is there can be a jump here, okay? So it has to go through zero, zero, but then the, there can be a jump, and then it can carry on up. That's the only place you can have a jump and keep it be concave. If you think about it, if you had a jump somewhere in here, it would no longer be concave, okay? So you can have that probability mass at zero. That means you, you basically always weight the largest loss, and it translates into a minimum rate online kind of a situation. All right, and then we know other ones are all, they all look about the same. I can I plead your indulgence just to go through the, the okay, thank you. All right, so we got this issue, right, that um, if you remember, those of you who are yesterday, Jesse had his spreadsheet, and it'll come back again, and we had our G primes, which were the adjustments we were going to do to the objective probabilities, and we had, we had G primes that were bigger than one for the high losses, which we all, well, that makes sense, that generates a lot of premium, but we had G primes that were less than objective. And it kind of feels like there, doesn't that mean I'm going to price certain layers below cost, which none of us would, would want to do, right? That doesn't really make sense. And with TVA, that situation gets even worse because everything from this point on, so this is a 95% TVA, it's, pr it's putting zero weight on 95% of the losses. So it sort of seems like if I've got some layer out here, I'm not going to charge anything for it, okay? And that just seems objectionable. John Christen does the big honking problem, which I think is great, great mm. terminology. So I, what I want to in, introduce you, how all of this distortion stuff is about understanding how people act, right? How do they behave? And the game is, uh, if you've got a distortion like this, okay, so <coughs> what does it mean in terms of how I act? Let's start with, if I'm risk neutral, how do I act? How do I price anything? Well, I simulate losses, which corresponds to picking random numbers between 0 and 1. I do my f inverse of p, my, my log inverse function to get my actual loss, and then I apply whatever layering I want to it, and I take the average, right? That would be how I would price if I was risk neutral. 
If I believe, if my view of the world is this TVAR view, what do I do? What I do now is I simulate losses randomly here, I, and then I look to see, okay, what P's do they correspond to? And what, so this is going to go down to here. It's going to go down to P's between 0 and 5%. And then I, because we're dealing with losses and we're actuaries, we actually have to flip it around. So they become, we do 1 minus P, and I get, I'm going to simulate all of my P's are going to be between 95% and 100%. And then I'm going to do my log inverse of that and simulate a whole bunch of big losses. And then I'm just going to price with that. I'm going to assume that that's the, that's the world. That describes it. Okay? So think about what does that do. Let's say my 95th percentile is $10 million. And I'm trying to price a layer um, a million x $5 million. Well, what am I going to do? I'm going to run my simulation machine. Every single simulation I get is going to be greater than $10 million because I'm going to pick random numbers between 95 and 100%. So I'm going to look at a million x5 and I'm going to go, total loss. Every single time I get a total loss. Right? So I'm just going to say I, I want 100% rate online for that. So that's the solution. That's what this is telling you is it's 100% rate online. It's not free cover. Now the wrinkle is, what if I said, somebody came along, your creative broker came along and said, Oh, we got a great deal for you. We will, here's what we'll do. We'll go in and we'll say, I want a million x5, but if it's a total loss, you don't get it. Right? Which we don't do. Obviously, this is beyond sorts of morale hazard problems and what have you. That somewhat perverse cover, TVAR would price for free. But people don't buy that cover. That cover doesn't really exist in the marketplace. Other than it's term life, if you think about it. It's the same as term life. But term life, you've got a big incentive to stay alive, so you don't have to worry. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that was the solution. It only took me like 40 hours to figure that out. Um, in a sleep deprived state, I finally got it. I was like, oh, yeah, right. Okay, this is, this is cool. So I did want to thank you, John, for, for letting me go through that. And uh, we'll go off. The decks here has got a bunch of nonsense in the appendix that you can read at your leisure.